morning's sermon passage comes to us from Luke's Gospel, the third chapter. I'll be reading beginning with verse 15 through 17, and then continuing with verses 22 through 23. Listen now for God's word to us. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn now when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying the heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove and a voice came from heaven you are my son the beloved with you I am well pleased this is the word of the Lord thanks be to God I invite you to pray with me ever-present, ever-loving, and ever-gracious Lord. As water splashed across our face awakens us in the morning, may your word awaken us to your presence here with us in this time and this place. Wash us in your wisdom. Bathe us in your goodness. Refresh us with your grace. By the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, if you have been listening to the children's message then, or reading your bulletin, then you know that today we celebrate and commemorate the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ. Baptism is one of our sacraments. It's something that Jesus participated in and commanded us to do. And in the 9 o'clock service, we had the great joy to celebrate the baptism of a 7-year-old girl and her mother. So baptism is a celebration and a joy, and it is mentioned, Jesus' baptism, in three places in the Bible. In Luke's gospel that we read from today, but also in Matthew and in Mark's gospel as well. Now if it were up to me, I would only pay attention and read to Mark's gospel, because that is a kinder, gentler version of Jesus' baptism. It's a little less scary. It doesn't anything about a baptism by fire. It doesn't talk about a winnowing fork. It doesn't talk about the wheat. In, <clears throat> into the granary or the chaff being burned by an unquenchable fire. That part of the story makes me a little bit uncomfortable. How about you? It makes me wonder who is the wheat and who is the chaff? Who is in and who is out? Because if we're honest with ourselves, then we know that Paul is right. Paul who says, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. We think about that often at this time of year, some of us who think about what has been. We have just shifted from the ending of one year and the beginning of another year. Have any of you made New Year's resolutions? We're almost halfway through January. Do people even make New Year's resolutions anymore? I have heard that a New Year's resolution is something that goes in one year and then out the other try as we might, it is very difficult to keep our plans for self-improvement and stick to it. Whether or not we make them, though, January is typically a time of the year when we spend a time, metaphorically speaking, looking in our rear view mirrors and our metaphorical windshields. Our rear view mirrors are the places where we remember everything that has been not only from the last year, but in our life, when we take a review, a mental review, all of the joys, all of the sensations. 
and a time when we also think about the things that didn't go so well, our disappointments, our heartaches, our missed opportunities to make an impact for Christ's kingdom here on earth. We had this little girl that I mentioned before, Alana, who was seven years old, who was just baptized at the nine o'clock service. Now, her view, rear view mirror doesn't have a whole lot in it after seven years because she hasn't had a whole lot of life experience under her belt. But her windshield, her windshield is full practically of limitless possibilities of things that she might do as a Christian and living out her baptism with God's help. And the reverse is true for, as for us as we age or seemingly true. Our rear view mirrors seem to get fuller and fuller and fuller as we live year after year after year. But our windshields, sometimes we think that the possibilities that we have for making an impact for God's kingdom start to dwindle. When we remember, however, that baptism is in our rear view mirror as well, everything changes. In baptism, we become a part of God's family and are assured that we are never alone in our efforts to grow into the people that God created us to be. The John mentioned in today's scripture reading is, of course, the John that we know as John the Baptist. John was the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth and also Jesus' cousin. Jesus was baptized by John, although John would have prevented it if he could. You see, a baptism of forgiveness of sins, but Jesus, who was fully divine and fully human, had, was sinless. He had nothing to repent of. And so in John's way of understanding things, he didn't need to be baptized. And I imagine that John, who knew that Jesus was the Messiah, was a little bit in awe and felt unworthy to the task. But Jesus, Jesus knew better. In order to receive forgiveness in the first century, there was a whole sacrificial system that Jewish people had to observe. If you did a very small sin, then you were required to go to the temple and make a sacrificial offering of either something small, grain, or a pair of turtle doves. But if you committed the worst of sins, then you were supposed to sacrifice a pure, spotless, unblemished lamb, the best of the flock. By submitting to baptism and then dying on the cross, Jesus, the Lamb of God, replaced the sacrificial system once and for all, showing us the depths of the costly love of God. On the day that Jesus was baptized, it is as if Jesus packed up all of our sins and brokenness in his knapsack, tied it up, and tossed it over his shoulder, and started his walk to Calvary. That is why he is sometimes called the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Because Jesus joined us in baptism, the heavenly words, this is my son, the beloved with whom I am well pleased, become Jesus' words to each one of us. That should indeed choke each of us up. A father of Presbyterian John Calvin taught <clears throat> that before we are born, even when we are in our mother's wombs as God's children, so what we commemorating what Jesus, God has already done in Jesus for us. So when we fall short, we remember our baptism. We were talking about bathing earlier with the children. 
Now this may be a pastor geeky thing, but every time I get in the shower, I think of that connection as the water is falling over me. I think of how Jesus has taken away all of my shortcomings, all of my sin once and for all. And I am reminded of what a supreme gift baptism is. In Beauty and the Beast, it's only when the beast discovers that beauty really loves him in all his ugliness that he himself becomes beautiful. In the experience of the Apostle Paul, it is only when we discover that God really loves us in all of our unlo unloveliness. Start to be godly. Paul's word for this gradual transformation of a sow's ear into a silk purse is sanctification. When John the Baptist referred to Jesus' baptism as a baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire, this is what, what John was referring to. He's talking about sanctification. When he tells us that the wheat shall be gathered into the granary and the chaff shall be burned with unquenchable fire, what we should be is comforted, not frightened. How wonderful it will be when the worst parts of ourselves will, with God's help and through the love of Christ, eventually fall away from us forever. Being sanctified, however, is a long and very painful process because we usually don't like to part with our vices any more than the beast wanted to give up his selfish ways. As good as Weight Watchers, Peloton, and Orange Theory may be, none can come close to making such a transformational claim. But little by little, the forgiven person starts to become a forgiven person, the healed person to become a healing person, and the loved person to become a loving person. God does most of it. The end of the process, Paul says, is eternal life. When Jesus joined with us in baptism, we were baptized into his life, his death, and his resurrection. That is the hope of our faith. And because of that hope, we know that the love of Christ with that in our rear view mirror and the fact that Jesus joined with us, that we have rear view mirrors and windshields that are limitless and eternal. A wise person once said is that our life is God's gift to us, but what we make of that life is our gift to God. Just as the new year gives us opportunity to reflect on what has been and what will be, for Christians, baptism of the Lord Sunday provides space to reflect on how we will live out our baptismal identity in the new year and beyond. Because Jesus has joined with us in baptism, we have then become be part of God's family, the saints that came before, the saints who are sitting next to you in the pews today, and the saints who will come. We have been forgiven once and for all, and free to walk in the footsteps of Christ, passing along the forgiveness, healing, and love that we have received. We have been blessed to be a blessing. Thanks be to God. Amen.